Okay, I think everyone's here who's probably going to be here. Um, but needless to say, we will persist. Online can't really see. So to the grand masses who have arrived, welcome, welcome all. Uh, we will begin tonight with a uh, acknowledgement of country, and then we'll have two short speakers, and then you're all invited to just simply hang around and partake in some food and nibbles and drinks, um, and yeah, just mingle, and we can yeah, I guess get to know each other from different cohorts of the geological community from around the state, which is what these things are designed to be and designed to get us together. So uh, without further ado, I acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet and acknowledge their continuing connection to land, waters and community. I pay my respects to the people, the cultures and the elders past and present. So with that said, we will launch straight into our talks and we will open with our student talk as has been customary um, this calendar year. And tonight we are hearing from Bowen Fang and Bowen will be telling us, uh, Bowen, sorry, is a paleoclimatologist and geochemist who has just completed the fourth year of his PhD. In his studies, he uses modern corals to reconstruct the paleo sea surface temperature of the Western Pacific warm pool, WPWP, and monitor the, and monitor and act the activity and intensity of the ENSO events over the past 200 years. In addition, he is preparing a new international carbonate standard for the Paleoclimate Society, which we'll, I think, hear about uh, now. So I'll invite Bowen up here. Thank you, Bowen. Okay, uh, let me try, okay. Uh, okay, welcome to the talk. Uh, so today I will mainly talk about uh, one of the part of my project is the develop a new international carbon standard. Uh, it's um, to like uh, use the proactive code base and the chat canna base. So my talk will be follow the, this outline. I'll give you a brief introduction first, and then um, we'll tell you how I prepare the samples and measure the samples, and then follow up with the results. Uh, and at the end, I will summar, uh, summary my work and the uh, future work we will be expected to do. Okay, so um, here is the coral samples and the uh, samples which we will already bleach. So uh, at the beginning, we say the picture is very colorful, but here it's like we all bleach them, so it's very white. Um, and then, um, so the uh, Chetikana samples there is the by shell. So actually these two shells, they form the one creature. Um, and the quite coral we, we uh, select is um, uh, this one. Um, so the coral standard, the original weight of the standard is, um, is 42 kilogram for the coral head and the Chetikana uh, is the 88 kilogram. Um, we sacrifice some uh, suboptimal samples to be set as the precontaminated sample. Uh, and these samples are, be, uh, are uh, used to like precontaminate the uh, machine. Uh, before we uh, apply the um, our clean uh, clean samples. So finally, we collect our uh, homogeneous and uh, clean uh, coral standard powders. is about ten kilogram, and the Chatikana standard is about uh, uh, powder is about eighteen kilogram. So we can see that was, um, we we uh, we sacrificed and discard a lot of samples. Um, so. For the uh, and then I'll give you a background of the why we want to develop the uh, new international carbon standards. So firstly, the core and Chetikana standards they are uh, they are very important and very common used to be uh, calculate the analytical uh, instruments such as the mass spectrometers. And this is these standards is uh, very important to uh, calculate the matrix effects. Uh, effects and then ensuring that we uh, the the data we produce. Uh, 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 when we analyze and core and genetic samples are correct. So it's very important to uh, monitor the data quality. And also it's important to comparison between the labs and the facility uh, compilation projects. So uh, here I summarize the, all the company standards we are uh, used now for the paleo uh, ocean uh, and paleo um, uh, and the uh, biogeochemistry uh, community. Uh, so the only natural uh, priorities core and the Chetikana standard samples are now using is the JCP1 and JCP1. Um, the other four uh, carbon standards, they are all the uh, synthetic uh, standards and they all use in different purpose. 
for example, the uh, MACS3 is mainly used for the chasing element calibration in the laser works. So it's more used to studies. Um, and RMA301, um, this standard is mainly used for the boron isotop studies and boron elements calibration. Um, and the IEA603, this one is mainly used for the carbon and oxygen isotopes um, calibration works. And we need to notice that this is the marble, it's not the uh, pro chatigana base. Uh, so how so the JCP1 and JCT1, these two are commercially run out. So that's one of the main uh, motivation that we want to have our uh, have a have a new one. And also uh, we want to make a very sufficient and uh, homogeneous uh, standard um, this time. So like can last for about 50 years. Um, so that's why we have a larger amount sample to be processed. So the logic to develop our geochemistry standard is like we um, we need to collect uh, very good sample and then we need to do very carefully preparation. This is very important because every process here, clean crush meal mix will be probably have some um, contamination. So it's very important to do the preparation work. And, and then we need to uh, measure the uh, uh, chemical uh, composition and isotopic uh, composition of the powder. And then we uh, publish paper and get the certification and then distribute this powder to our cooperative labs and uh, uh, and for global research use and uh, do the interlab studies. <clears throat> so the aim uh, of this is like we want to have a very homogeneous composition of these trace elements and these isotopes, which is um, very useful process for the pilot oceanography. Uh, so they have been used in a lot of areas, like to monitor the, uh, uh, to reconstruct the sea surface temperature, uh, salinity, and to do some learn about the biological uh, process, for example, the coral bleach events. Uh, so they all, all of these elements and isotopes, they are very important and very common use uh, now for doing these works. Um, and the facilities are used in ISS, mainly this uh, SRD, ICP, OES, and ICP MOS, and RMS. I will introduce late, uh, later. So the SRD is used uh, for the uh, components test, like to test um, what the components of the powder of the, like if that the pure organite or the pure calcite. Um, so the ICPOES is mainly used for the uh, element ratio studies. And the IMS is used for the carbon and oxygen isotopes measurement. The ICP mass is used for the very, um, a tra uh, the trace elements, which have very low concentration. So first, like for the SRD test, we can see, uh, so these, are, these two is the, what we use for um, the main part for our uh, standard. So we can see that it's almost 100% argonite. So the difference between uh, organized calcite, they have the same, they're all the carbon calcite, but um, uh, they have different metrics. Uh, what we want is the 100% is the 100 argonite because um, that is uh, match the coral and shady candle standards met, uh, much. Uh, and then all these parts is we use to the comparison with the these two main parts. Like we can see like the um, coal hole, warm hole is like this one. This is the warm hole. Uh, it's a bio version. So we can see like it's not 100% uh, argonite. And for the surface, uh, Chetikana yellow surface is like this one. So this is connect the, uh, the shell and the organic, uh, but uh, organics. So, um, so we can see it's only 95%. So we will discard all of them uh, and to make sure the powders we collect, we collect is the 100% organized. So here is the structure of the priority coral and the uh, Chetikana. So we can see the uh, um, <coughs> priority coral, they have um, uh, a lot of, uh, so the coral, this is the coral top. So the top is uh, contain a lot of the organic matters, like we, we, we don't want them. Um, so the skeleton, they are very pure organized. Uh, for the Chetikana, they have three parts, hinge part, inner part, uh, and outer layer part. So the scientists mainly use the inner uh, layer part for doing the uh, research because it's, um, it's, uh, it has very good annual cycle and it's um, very, uh, it has less the bio erosion uh, in the inner part. So that's, that's, so this is the part what we are choose as well. So we just uh, got the hinge and the outer layer and only uh, use the inner layer for our um, uh, standard. So here it says like we do the um, cutting work in the uh, tumor uh, with this huge saw and we use the ICS minor diamond saw to do the um, uh, adjustment. 
so you can see we have very uh, beautiful uh, coral and it's um and uh, and it's like it's very beautiful but we also can see like uh we have a lot of valuation here which we want to uh discuss as well so uh after that after we remove all these not useful things and collect some suboptimal uh uh samples uh for the pre-condemnation uh purpose so then uh we can see the environment is not very clean so we need to do the uh ultrasonic uh medical water clean here and then uh we, we put them into the oven to dry uh, uh to dry them under the 60 degrees for two weeks uh, until they fully dry, uh, we put them into the uh, pills and box. So we we collect the two pills of the coral sa uh, samples and the one box of the um, uh, <coughs> cherry candle samples. And then we do the sample crushing in GA, Geoscience of Australia, and then put the uh, large piece into the crusher and then it comes out with the chips uh, uh, and then we sieve them and then we collect them into the bags. After this process is we need to do some acid clean to remove the metal uh, because like the crushing and the cutting, they have a lot of them uh, probably have potential uh, metal contamination. So we put them into the uh, weak, very weak acid clean for the uh, 0.5 more uh, nitric acid um, to remove this metal and potential uh, contamination as well, like dust mine. Uh, and put them into, after the uh, acid clean, we put them into the medical water to do the ultrasonic bags again. And then we can see it's very effectively to move these um, 30s. Uh, and then, uh, so finally, we, we, our aim is to get the water uh, very clean, look like this is very clean. So then we we, we, we dry these samples. Uh, yeah, we dry these chips uh, into the oven as well. Uh, until it's fully dry, we move them to the Mueller. So this one, this one is the disc meal we use in Geoscience of, uh, of Australia. Uh, and the the advantage of the this meal is they have uh when the when it's running uh sorry yeah when it's running uh it has um uh uh we can control the temperature in very low uh, uh temperature like the calm is under sixty degree and pro is under forty degree so this is very important because um uh when the decrease uh, uh when the temperature increase um the organite will transfer to the calcite. Uh, so that's what why we don't want. Um, and the thick meal is less sticky. Uh, we can see it's less sticky, and it's uh, it can be continuously run. Um, it's fast, and they have very high quality. It can make a very homogeneous powder. The practical size is uh, controllable. Uh, we got very fine powder at the end. Ninety percent is under two hundred micrometer. Uh, and the material is the tungsten carbide, which is really hard. Um, so that's really ideal um material for us to uh mill the sample. And then we put them into the mixer uh, to mix the sample uh, overnight for 24 hours. Um, so we, between the coral and the can sample, we we do the very cleaning. And before we running our samples, we put a pre-contamination sample to pre-contaminate the machine as well. Um, so for the hom homogeneity test, we collect eight different levels from the bottom to surface. So we have um, eight different level samples. Then we do the homogeneity test between this um among these um eight levels so finally we got is the um, 80 kilogram standard sample for chaticana and 10 kilogram uh, standard for the coral and then we do the sample measurement we prepare the samples weight one milligram sample and then we add four milligram uh, natural ash, uh, ash um, to the uh, in the clean station to make 100 ppm uh, calcium solution uh, samples and then we measure the trace elements in ICP MOS first, and then transfer the same sample to the ICP OES for measuring the strontium calcium and magnesium calcium ratio. Uh, we do the standard calibration by using the bracketing standard solution I made in the uh, 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 by use the mixed uh, single standard solution, and we use the JCP, JCT, and IMA three O one. So these three certified standards for our calibration as well. Okay, so now it's the, let's we see the results. So the most important scientific question for the um public standard uh, for the standard is like we need to have a very homogeneous standard. Uh, so how to assess the if the powder is homogeneous? We need to look at the uh 
RSD. So we we um so we expect RSD should be under ten percent, and we can see most of our samples they have um that the elements uh RSD that is under ten percent, which is really good. Uh, for some elements they are a little bit higher than ten percent is because they have super low uh ultra low uh, concentration, which we can see it's um it's even probably lower than the uh, uh limitation of the detection of the uh instrument. So uh here's the diagram showing like um comparing our standards with the JCP JCT. So we can see most of the elements we have similar concentration uh with the JCP JCT which is really good, but some elements that have uh much lower concentration. Um, this might be because they have uh, they they come from different location, uh, different time, different period, and also we apply the acid clean method. Uh, but for the JCP JCT, they only use the milliliter water clean. So this is probably some elements expected. We have uh, much lower concentration, but um, all in all, we can we we thought we our result is really good to be um to become a, a standard. And let's look at the ICPOES result for the element uh, calcium ratio. So for this, we are expecting the RSD is under one percent. That would be very good. For the strontium calcium, it's the best um under uh the standard deviation is uh under point oh two uh that we, we that we can say it's really uh, ideal standard. So we can see our standards except the magnesium calcium is a little bit higher uh, standard deviation. But all like all the others, like it's um uh, uh for but for the strontium calcium it has pretty good. And for the magnesium calcium ratio, it's probably from the layer six, it's like have some difference for the layer six. Um uh it's have a large range. So uh yeah, so but still in the uh, under one percent. So we thought it's still good enough for um to be a standard. And for the Tradicana. Uh, for the calm is much better. We can see here it's much homogeneous and it less uh difference between uh, among different levels. So for the isotope studies, we can see like uh we are expecting uh our standard deviation is under uh point one um and the RSD is um uh like under point uh, five percent um and here we can see like uh, uh our course is like um only the uh. Carbon isotope is a little bit higher, but this is might be because of some uh, the outer layer of this one. So if we remove this um our uh our layer uh if uh if we remove this, we can see we got very good results as well. So uh, so this one we only test one layer for one sample. So the last the elements we test three uh sample per uh per layer. So so that means probably means like we require we do further like more samples to each layer to get um. Uh, a more accurate uh result, and for the Tradicana, it's really good. I mean, um, uh, even though we didn't remove this R layer, we still got a very good uh, standard deviation RSD. So, which means we, our Tradicana is more homogeneous than the coil. So at the end, um, so we got the parties coil reference material NUP is um ten kilogram, uh, and we got the Tradicana is about eighteen kilogram. We have determined the concentration of trace elements in ANUP and ANUT, and typically with, with um, precision under 10% RSD. Um, we have determined uh, element ratio as well. We got very good, good, good result for the element ratio. Uh, and for the isotopic uh, ratios, uh, isotopic compositions, we got very uh, homogeneous um, carbon and oxygen isotopes as well. So that's it's very important. Like uh, additional data for this material should be acquired by different techniques. Say so, like we. We only use SPOES and SPMOS, but probably we can have teams as MC SPMOS and laser uh SPMOS work as well. Uh and the interlab study for the element calcium ratio and other isotopes uh measurements are welcome in order to allow our standards to be established as the international reference material. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. So we are very, very lucky to have Megan presenting to us today. Um Professor Megan Miller is an observational seismologist enthusiastic about solving outstanding questions in plate tectonics that range from the formation of protons to earthquake processes on active faults. She obtained a BA in physics and geology from Whittier College in Los Angeles, MSc from Columbia University, and a Master in Engineering at Cornell University, and PhD at ANU. 
She was a tenured professor at the University of Southern California for eight years and then returned to the ANU in 2017. In her research, she combines the use of novel seismological techniques, including the collection of new data in regions where none are available, mm. integrated with other sometimes disparate geological and geophysical data. Currently, she has seismic deployments out in Alaska, Western Australia, and New Zealand. She is the director for AUScope Earth Imaging and currently on an ARC Future Fellowship, focusing on the use of distributed acoustic sensing in seismic imaging. So with that said, I'll hand over to Mika. Thank maybe, you. maybe you can make all those things disappear because I yep. can't. Uh, yep, no worries. You know the secret. Um, yeah, anyway, thank you very much for the invitation. So I'm going to tell you about um, what I've been doing for my future fellowship, um, which is working on photonic seismology. Um, and so that was the title of the, the future fellowship um, program. Okay, so I'm, I'm um, interested in the evolution of the earth generally and how um, I investigate that is by looking at earthquakes. So this is um, a map, a, you know, global map of earthquakes which are color coded um, with depth. So lots of yellow ones are shallow earthquakes and then you can see that with the Tonga subduction zone they get to be purple and blue. And I'm gonna use Bowen's fancy laser. Perhaps. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the deeper ones come here. Um, and so how I use earthquakes is to image the Earth's, um, the Earth's interior. And so you may, may be more familiar with all of the deployments that ANU and GA and others have deployed over the past 40 years or so. Um, this is a map that Brian Kennett made last year um, in which uh, the data of which that we looked at the cross mantle boundary or the MOHO. Um, and so there's been many more since then, Oz Array, WA Array, and so on. But this gives you a kind of flavor for how, what the distribution of the instrument types that we use to try to understand um, the, the Earth from a seismological perspective. So each of these individual symbols are one seismometer, and they record um, earthquakes, any type of ground motion, and then we use those to um, do Im make images of the Earth. Um, so this is what it's looked like over the past 40 years or so. Many of these were only out for six months, maybe 18 months or so, and then you pick them up and move them away and then they're used for, for a different um, project for, uh, for new data collection. So very much looks like spot measurements. Some of these are uh, hundreds of kilometers, if not thousands of kilometers um, apart. Um, and just to give everybody kind of a background for some fundamentals in seismology, um, so, on the left, I'm going to show you um, the different types of what seismic waves that we looked at, how they move through the Earth's interior, and also the ground motions associated with those. And so there's three main types of uh, seismic waves. Um, there's P waves and S waves. We call those the body waves because they travel through the body of the Earth. This is familiar to some of the students that have taught this before. Um, and then, so I'm going to show some seismograms which are going to be shown at A, B, C, and D, and those are represented by um, seismometers that are at A, B, C, and D on the Earth's interior, and we'll have one earthquake um, recorded here, and these cartoons are going to show how the ground moves, so the little houses will move in the direction of which the ground moves, and then you'll see the seismogram down here, which is a time series of the ground motion. Okay, so earthquake happens, these different waves travel through the Earth's interior, some would travel around the surface of the Earth, and the different ways that the cow and the horse and everything, uh, and cow and houses move, um, shows you how the ground is, is moving in response to the different waves that um, travel through the, the Earth's interior. And so that's like how we um, record them at these traditional seismometers, like the map um, that, of, that I showed of Australia. And at each one of these different seismometers, there actually has three components. So when a seismic wave comes, we have motion that's showing up and down motion, vertical motion. We have one that's uh, and two more that are orthogonal in the horizontal components. So we orient the seismometer so we have ground shaking uh, relative to north, south, and to east, west. And so we can use these three components to then deconvolve what the, se the seismic wave is doing um, through the Earth's interior and use that for many different um, techniques. Okay, so those obviously were cart cartoons. I'm gonna show you some real data. So this was um, 
about you know more than almost 15 years ago now that this um, earthquake um, happened. Um, I usually chose this one because this is the first month that I started teaching <laughs> as a um, as a lecturer, um, and so I use this um, all the time. Um, this large earthquake that happened in Haiti it was a magnitude seven, which was um, very devastating for for um, the country. Um, but it happened at a time where we had many different seismometers um, deployed across the United States. And so this was a very big program called USRA. It was funded by the National Science Foundation. It's um, in many ways quite similar to what GA is doing um, um, with OSRA, where they're putting out seismometers all the way across the continent. And so each of these little dots that are at the time um, were in the middle of the, of the continent were spaced 70 kilometers apart. I mean, there was more than 400 out at one time, and this was kind of the first time that we could see uh, from these individual seismometers what the entire wave field was looking at at, at once. So you know, before we just had you know, a few seismometers um, spread across the country, um, but this time we had them equally spaced, and you can actually see what the wave field looks like as the seismic waves are traveling across um, the continent. So this is going to show um, real data. There's one seismogram down at the bottom. So this is a time series showing the ground motion in the ver vertical sense. And so you'll see these wiggles that showing up is uh, ground motion up and down is ground uh, is down is pushing it down. Um, these dots that are shown in, um, in the continental U United States are each of these individual seismometers. And they're going to be color coded by their motion where ground motion is up um, is blue and red is, um, is down. And then we'll also see these wave fronts of the P waves, S waves, and surface waves traveling across there. So for reference, Haiti is over here, and the ground, the seismic waves are going to travel in this direction. And this one seismogram that's shown here is at, um, in the middle of Texas at this um, particular place. Okay, so the earthquake happens in Haiti. These seismic waves travel out. And you'll see that the ground is moving up and down as the uh, P wave and S wave travel across, and then the more higher amplitude surface waves come. And you can actually see these going up and down. And of course, these are very, very small motions. They're micrometers. So of course, we don't feel them. Um, or, you know, these sensors, uh, we would not feel them if we were there at those sensors, but the instruments are sensitive enough that we can actually um, record this type of data. OK, um, so. Using that type of data, we can do all sorts of different types of techniques to try to image the, um, the subsurface of the, of the Earth. And um, a couple of, of quite popular ones that people may know are seismic tomography, and in particular, ambient noise um, tomography, is, which is becoming um, quite popular and uh, known in the exploration community and, and elsewhere. So I'm not going to talk about all these different types of techniques that we use but all of them have a, a similar flavor to um, CAT scan or MRI images. So the same ideas of, uh, of using those sorts of algorithms for imaging um, our bodies, uh, we use to image the, the Earth's interior. So I'm gonna talk about the tomography ones in particular. Um, so in the past, uh, ANU um, has done a, a really nice job of imaging the Australian um, lithosphere. Um, and so back in the in the 90s, there is the, um, the Skippy array, which was um, one of these first ones with an actually inspired US array, went across um, the continent. And this was one particular model of it at the depth of about 140 kilometers depth. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, and Rob Vanderhilst was, uh, was academic here at the time. Um, Stuart Fishwick was my classmate. We were PhD classmates. Um, and so in the, in the 2000s, he created this model. And then uh, very recently, we have a new postdoc, um, Fabrizio, who's created this model using ambient noise tomography. And these two are using teleseismic tomography. Um, and generally, in all of these ones, you see these blues or greens or darker colors are the faster um, velocities associated with the cratons, um, and then the slower ones with the most young, the younger rocks um, in the eastern coast. So that's kind of leading up to um, you know, the big scale of what had been done over the, um, the past 40 years, but we can use the same sort of methodology to do um, various different types of resolution. So we can look at um, the, the Yilgarn Craton in WA. This was a pro project um, Caleb mentioned that have these seismometers out. Um, and this is Ping Zhang's work um, as a postdoc here. And um, there is also work by Nick Rawlinson and his student um, in Tasmania. 
And then another postdoc, um, Ching Ching Jang, who's working with me, is looking at Lake George just up, um, up the road. And so looking at these different types of length scales, we can look at the whole continent, or we can even get down to a few um, uh, hundreds of meters. And many of these techniques shown here are just using ambient noise, not even having to wait for earthquakes to, to create them. Um, but we still have a resolution problem. So we're getting down to tens of meters, but of course, um, just like Bowen said, you know, if we're looking at rocks that, um, we, um, or, or corals or anything else, we want to actually look at the, either a hand sample or we want to look at something much smaller, um, even down at the, and, um, into the uh, a microscope level. Um, so how can we get better resolution of what's happening um, with the rocks and the Earth's interior? Um, I think the way forward is photonic seismology. So what is photonic seismology? It is the use of fiber optic cables. So our telecom cables that we use to get our internet, um, but using, um, using these um, to actually create the, uh, to record the ground motion, but using light. So the light that's traveling um, down a fiber optic cable, we can use that to actually uh, record ground motion and seismic waves. And so the most popular um, method or tech, uh, instrument that we can use is, is called distributed acoustic sensing. And so it is basically a fancy laser. Actually, I show this. It repurposes um, telecommunication cable, cables into high, um, into seismic sensors that have very high resolution. So obviously the cables are running everywhere, right? And so we can um, use those cables and the imperfections within the, the fiber optic cables itself. Each of those imperfections can scatter the light back and we can use that as an individual sensor. So here's the principle of how this technique works. We have um, an interrogator, a DAS interrogator. Um, this is basically a fancy laser um, and a computer all built in one. Uh, we attach this unit to a fiber optic cable, which is shown here. And we um, shoot a laser just like this down the fiber optic cable. We measure the flight time from this pulse of laser going out, and then it gets uh, backscattered and reflected by some of the imperfections within the um, the cable itself, and we time it when it comes back. And so if the fiber stretches when an earthquake comes by and deforms, we can actually tell whether this little imperfection has moved a little bit this way or this way. And those tiny little motions in the fiber from the seismic waves, we can measure um, with light. Um, and so as you can imagine, we can look at these little um, deformation or timing between these different pulses and when they come back, and that tells us about the seismic waves. And so this can, is revolutionizing seismology because um, we can attach these types of instruments to all the different fiber optic cables. So they um, go below um, our oceans, um, they go beneath our cities, um, and they can record um, earthquakes like this one here. We can measure the uh, crustal thickness. Um, we can also um, measure uh, how aquifers are changing. We can get we record um, ground motions that come from waves in the ocean, from faraway volcanoes, also from traffic and trams. Um, and we can also do this for imaging resources and actually tracking storms as well. Um, so the first big, big experiment that we started was um, in Melbourne um, about two and a half years ago. And so this is Boon, she's postdoc in my group, uh, setting up an um, instrument at RMIT. And we went to, went to Melbourne because um, I were invited by a, pro, a photonics professor there who said that he had access, or he saw that I got funded for the future fellowship. And then he said, well, I've got access to fiber. Do you want to come down to my lab and use it? And so this fiber goes from RMIT and it actually goes all the way out to Monash. And there's a big loop. And so, and it goes, um, there's a Southern loop and then this one as well. Um, and it's research grade fiber installed by RNET, which so many of you may know that we get, um, you know, we can move files between research institutions using this, um, this fiber uh, cable. And this was um, put in dedicated to do photonics experiments. So what we did is we went to RMIT, installed um, our instrument here at this photonics lab, and then we um, used this part of the cable um, to try to, to record um, these types of, uh, of seismic waves and many um, other things. What's fantastic is what you used about 25 kilometers worth uh, length of cable at four meter spacing. So as, uh, as we have more than two, uh, more than 6,000 channels. So that's like 6,000 sensors. So instead of having, you know, those hundreds of sensors across the continent, we have 6,000 along this um, portion of the, um, the Eastern suburbs in Melbourne. 
And another side note is we don't know, didn't know exactly where the fiber was. So we actually have to go out into the city and bang with a sledgehammer to generate a little seismic source and try to actually map where the fiber is. And so the initial fiber map we had was nowhere near this. And so we were going around all over the place trying to bang to try to find it. And you see that Boone is holding a computer here. We're basically attached back to this computer here and looking to see if we can have a signal. So we either stomp or jump and you could tell where, where um, the fiber was. So lots of different signals, as you can imagine, in a very busy urban environment. <laughs> Many are trams. And so this is what we call a waterfall plot. Um, so these are all these individual channels or sensors um, here, distance along the fiber. And all of these diagonal lines here are different forms of traffic. So of course, this is time and distance. You can see the velocity of the different um, vehicles that are moving. And they're all going fairly slow because it's uh, Melbourne, you know, less than 60 uh, kilometers per hour. And these horizontal lines, um, this one in particular is a bridge over the Yarra. Um, and so a bit the, the fiber is um, in a conduit underneath the bridge. And so it's not coupled to the ground. So it just shakes the whole time and rattles as the trams go, go above. But these are actually useful because we can use this as a noise source for imaging. So looking at the Earth's interior. We can also record small earthquakes. This was a magnitude three earthquake that was about 120 kilometers away from Melbourne. Um, here's the P wave at those 6,000 different channels. And here's the S wave coming in here. So instead of just having one sensor in Melbourne, we have 6,000. Um, we can also record very distant earthquakes to look at deeper, surf, um, deeper structures. So, so this is a, a large earthquake in Indonesia, magnitude 7.3. Again, this is the ground shaking uh, recorded by the, by the light in that uh, fiber optic cable. Um, so here's literally just submitted in the last hour. So this is really, 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 really hot off the press. <laughs> um, so Boone just submitted this. Um, so this is uh, again, a map of that same fiber um, and shown in Google um, Earth. And then overlaid on top is the um, lithology um, from the portal at GA. Um, and so the basalts are these pink ones, uh, the fluvial alluvium is the orange, so here's the Yarra River, um, and then they, these green ones are uh, gra uh, gravels and, oh sorry, it's siltstones, the gray is gravels and rubble, then sandstones, siltstones, and so you can see where the fiber um, goes across from um, there. Um, and so we use traffic noise to create an image of the subsurface. So this is a profile along this portion of the fiber from about kilometer um, six out to kilometer 22. Um, and these colors are showing the, sh um, the shear wave velocity or the velocity of the subsurface in the top 100 meters. And at the top, you can see that the colors uh, correspond to the lithological units that we got from the, the portal. And so um, no, not surprising, um, there's at, near the surface, it's much slower velocities. And then um, as you get to 100 uh, meter steps, it gets um, a little bit faster. And, but you can see the change between basalts and the, in the um, sandstones and siltstones um, quite, quite sharp. Um, and this is um, particularly interesting because we're just using the traffic noise um, during the day from vehicles. So we're using that as instead of earthquakes to make this subsurface map of the top 100 um, the top hundred meters, and say, why are you doing? Why are you doing this in Melbourne? Well, this is kind of the first uh, proof of concept, but also you can do seismology in an urban environment doing completely innovative methods just using existing infrastructure. Um, so, why this is important? The top um, hundred meters is critical to do seismic hazard um, uh, forecasting and try, and also to um, think about how buildings um, respond. So remember, we talked about these different types of um, seismic waves um, and how they um, and how the ground shakes, but it also um, shakes when you have it shakes differently when you have different types of rock. So here's a house with solid bedrock, doesn't move that much. That was the P wave, which is, has a smaller amplitude. The S wave has a larger amplitude. You can see that the ground motion is much more significant when you're purely cons um, consolidated sediment. Um, but it's the surface waves, these rolling surface waves, which are the ones that do the most damage. And so when you get these poorly consolidated sediments, you get a whole lot more um, ground shaking, get damage to structures uh, and water saturated sand and mud, um, even more um, shaking due to liquefaction and other words, and you can get complete um, collapse from, from these. 
And so understanding um, the, the top 30 meters in particular, it was called VS30 or understanding that, um, that parameter, the shear wave velocity of the rocks in the top 30 meters is critical to engineer um, uh, built structures pro properly. And so the, here's two real um, seismograms uh, from the 1989 uh, Loma Prieta earthquake on a rocky bed ground. You can just look, um, look at these uh, qualitatively that the uh, amplitude of the seismograms are much smaller on a rocky bedrock in comparison to a loose sedimentary fill where some of those um, the structures completely collapsed in the Bay Area um, from that earthquake. And so Melbourne does have earthquakes. I think um, hopefully everybody in this audience knows that we do have that. But what's, um, what's really cool is that we're actually doing this work in New Zealand as well. And so for obvious reasons, seismic hazard is um, uh, uh, quite serious in New Zealand. Here's a map of the large earthquakes that occurred um, in New Zealand over the past almost 200 years. So the red ones are shown are the ones that happened from between 1840 and 1940. Um, from 1940 to 2008, were shown in the green. And these ones that happened much more recently in the last 15 years, but you'll notice this absence of a lot of uh, large earthquakes on the South Island. Um, the paleo seismic record is very um, uh, incredibly strong for trying to figure out when the last part, uh, last um, large earthquakes occurred on the Alpine Fault in the South Island. Um, and uh, the last one happened at 307 years ago in 1717. Um, and so this, um, this part of the South Island, um, there's kind of, a, you know, need to take it quite seriously that there is very likely that there will be um, a large magnitude, at least seven, if not eight, um, in the next 50 years in the Southern section. Um, and so to better understand what may happen when this earthquake does occur, we need to be able to better characterize what the fault looks like at depth. And so we're doing this um, in two different uh, experiments. The first one um, I will talk about um, is using a uh, telecom fiber. So Taurus is kind of like Telstra, but it's a, net, it's a crown infrastructure instead. Um, the first experiment um, is near the small town of Cost, and we're calling it Sizzle, the South Island Seismology by the Speed of Light experiment. And so this is, um, me and Boone and John Townen at Vic. Um, and this is where we have um, the instrument set up. Um, so here um, is a sizzle project. Here is setting up the, size, um, the interrogator in that little hut. Um, and you can see these, all these cables here um, are located in that hut. And that is new uh, access to fiber that just came down this uh, Highway 6. There's only three roads across, um, across the uh, the island and go to the west coast and uh, fiber was just installed there in 2022 allow allowing us to do um, such experiments and so we also installed some seismometers too which are shown here so we have um, about 30 kilometers of cable the hut is located here and goes up the um, the highway up to this um, point which is called roaring billy falls if anyone has um, been to that part of the south island um, so we did two deployments in 2023. Um, there are many earthquakes, as you can imagine. Um, during our first deployment, there was over 4,700 in New Zealand um, during that about uh, nine-week period. Um, then we did a second deployment um, later in the year, and we have more than 2,000 um, earthquakes that occurred um, during that period. Um, and the amount of data is uh, enormous. So we record a terabyte per day um, using the, the interrogator. Um, so here's an example of some of these earthquakes here. This was one earthquake that occurred 50 uh, kilometers away from Host. And then just a couple minutes later, we had another one, magnitude 4.3. So we circle, the, circle through again, here's time. That's a magnitude 2.4 that comes in there. And then um, just, 30 seconds later, here's the magnitude 4.3, the P wave, and then the S wave. And so this is the distance out to um, about 30 kilometers. We had more than 7,000 channels along that on this 25 kilometers of, of, of uh, fiber. And that to, was just you know one minute of data. There's so many earthquakes. Um, and so what we can do to try to um, use this type of earthquakes is look at um, what we call record sections. So this is basically turning the axes on side. Each of these are the individual channels or wiggles. 
Um, and then this is time shown here. We're looking at one earthquake that occurred located here on the Alpine Fault. Here's the our cable. Um, and so this uh, earthquake and the waves traveled basically through this fault zone um, up towards where our cable is located here. And I color coded the cable to these different sections. And so even qualitatively, you can see that the, the amplitude of the wiggles and how bright they are, how dark they are changes um, along here. And that's due to the different types of rocks and the, the fault gouge in the middle, which is shown here in yellow, um, much more cohesive uh, rocks in the red, or sorry, in the blue, and then um, something different again on the other side of the fault. And so, um, and we can look at all these different individual wiggles or all the converted phases and all these different um, uh, scattered uh, waves due to how the rocks interact um, when this wave travels by. So stay tuned for that. Um, we also had, of course, lots of many other thousands of earthquakes, very distant ones, where we recorded this really big magnitude 7.7 uh, xenomogenic um, event as well. And then most recently, we have another experiment called Fizzle. So now Sizzle, now Fizzle, this is pure land um, seismic sensing of landslide and earthquakes. So we're not just looking at um, earthquakes now, but we're also trying to track landslides. So you can imagine that the cable um, um, deforms um, when we have uh, uh, landslides as well. So we installed um, the DAS in June, late June in uh, Milford Sound, located here and now on, on, on June 19th. Um, so here was where Host is. Here's the Alpine Fault that goes offshore just, um, just near Milford Sound. And here is um, the, the next cable that we're using. And so we have about 31 kilometers in length. Um, again, we have more than 7,000 channels and um, we're recording uh, you know, terabytes per day. And so we're trying to um, see if we can capture some of those landslides which are, are happening um, over winter in particular and hopefully spring. So um, yeah, that just happened. Here's um, one earthquake that occurred the day that we were installing. Again, you see these beautiful P waves and S waves at more than 7,000 channels. And this was a magnitude 1.7, more than um, 30 kilometers away, but you still see these beautiful waveforms from, from the earthquake. So imagine what we can do with all this fiber. So here's the Arnett fiber uh, for um, Australia. So this is the one that uh, uh, researchers can access easily and we use to transfer our data around. Um, but of course we have the whole um, global subsea fiber network um, as well. Um, so we could potentially tap into all this existing infrastructure to have all these types of recordings of, of earthquakes and many other different phenomena. Um, but there's a lot of limitations, of course. Um, so currently we have a maximum length of sampling that's about 40 kilometers. Um, we can only uh, have set lengths and frequencies that we can record at, and we have very large um, volumes of data. But just think if we could extend the dis distance of sensing, if we could use those giant cables that go across the ocean, what if we could actually sense along a particular area along the fiber instead of recording all of it, but we could actually um, look at the fiber and what's happening on the fiber near Tonga when we know that there is an eruption coming. What if we could use the signals that are already transmitting in the fiber, not the ones that aren't currently being used? Um, and what if we could decrease the, the volumes of data? And even better, what if we could, um, we could process the data in real time instead of having to go pick up a giant hard dot drive like we're doing now? Um, I think the way forward is um, combs. So this is our, a center of excellence um, that um, a CI on is led out of um, RMIT. And um, we're trying to use uh, photonic um, technology and engineering to try to tackle some of these problems. And so we'll be working on that for the next seven years or so. So um, I have a few more slides, but I think I'll, I'll leave, leave it there because that's a lot of information. Thank you.